All of the food we eat and much of the clothing we wear comes from plants and animals that are raised on farms. Farms are different in type, in size, and even in name. Welcome to Barn Talk. What happens at the barn stays in the barn, but not today. We're going to let it all out for you guys. Today is going to be a Q&A episode. I know you guys have been waiting and waiting and waiting for this to come out. Uh, we've gotten a lot more questions. Free, we got more questions more frequent, and we really appreciate everybody that has submitted a question. If you want to get your question answered, submit to barntalkshow at gmail.com. That's where we get our questions in, and that's where... We'll see him, and that's how we'll answer him. Um, but before we get into the Q&A, uh, pay the fee, guys. If you get any value from the show, share it out with your friends, family, coworkers, employees, whoever. We're trying to grow this thing. The more you guys share the show, the better guests we can have on. Um, it's kind of the ticket to admission to watch or listen to the show. So thank you to everybody that has been doing that and continues to do it. Um, leave, a re- uh, leave a review on Spotify or Apple. We're up to like 480 five-star reviews on Spotify, and 208 on Apple. And for the size podcast that we have, the amount of reviews that we have for the size uh, is, like, phenomenal. If you look at other... you guys are awesome. Yeah, it, it means you guys really do do the due diligence of leaving a review and paying the fee. So we really do appreciate that tremendously. Um, but no market update today. We're going to just get right into the Q&A, right into the nitty-gritty, because we got some damn good questions. So... Uh, Question number one. I'm this ready. is this is from Travis, and also just to throw out there, when you guys submit a question, we'll just use your first name. We won't use your last name because if you ever want to ask us something really deep or personal, we're not gonna we're not gonna expose you to the world. So yeah, and if you uh, do want to add something uh, deep or personal, we love aliases. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You could always you could always have an alias. That that's all right too. What's your alias? Uh, Larry Kenegendorf. Yep. That's my. That's a pretty good. Actually, one. that's a great alias, but he is a real person. He's actually a friend of my father-in-law. But when I used to work uh, the trade shows, and I would get somebody that caught me in an aisle or caught me in a booth that I didn't really want to talk to, and I didn't want to give out my personal information, they'd introduce themselves and say, "Hey, you know who are you?" And I just like clockwork. Be yep, Larry, Larry Knegendorf. I'm from Kenosha, Wisconsin, and I worked at Baldwin Telecom, and it worked like a charm. And uh, Ultimate- hopefully. Hopefully the real Larry never got any uh, crap emails or junk mail because of me, but I used to use his name. Professional bullshitter. Yep, absolutely. You need to put that in your profile. 100%. Yeah, your LinkedIn profile. Uh, Yeah, so this is from Travis. Shout out to you, Travis. Thanks for the question. My question is, my question has to do with grain prices and how do you guys decide when to sell, how much to sell, and the risks involved. Any contracts you get from the elevator and which ones you like the best and how they work. So I'll give you the, I'll give you the, there's a multi multitude of ways to answer that. And the first simple answer is, uh, we sell grain when we need money. That's number one. (laughs) And I wish we were in a position where we didn't need it and we could just sit on it until we thought it was good. But, um, what I do really is I start out the year and I, I know what my expenses are. I know what I've got invested in the crop that I'm going to put in the ground. And I'm looking out and I'm, I use crop insurance, so I buy crop insurance. Um, so I know that worst case scenario, I've got a proven up yield off of what I've raised the last however many years that I know worst case scenario, I'm going to get this many dollars of income if things really go to pot. And that gives me, I guess you'd say that gives me peace of mind that I can go out and say, okay, if the right price is available for fall delivery of corn or soybeans at one of the local elevators or at the river, if I want to pay the truck and get to the river, um, I'll go ahead and forward contract. Now, I haven't always done that. 
In fact, I want to say that maybe three years ago was the first time that I ever sold any crop before that crop was made. But today, it's like anything, you kind of get a comfort level with it. And so I'm looking out, and when I get to, you know, the markets run on, they run on fear, 100% fear. They trade fear is what they do. And um, they run up on fear, and then if fear subsides, that's how they drop. And when you look out, um, sometimes you get an opportunity, and you can capitalize on that. So the most crop that I will ever sell ahead is maybe like 25%. So not a lot, but something. And I'll look at that as, okay, I've got this much of my crop priced and I've got this much income guaranteed um, out of what's out of what's going to happen. It, does that usually pay what's left if the insurance comes in to right. play? So right. you'll, you'll market ahead 25% and you know that that's guaranteed and that's going to pay the expenses right. for I, your crop. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, we are, and I, you've heard me say this, and I'll tell you, an upcoming, ep- an upcoming episode definitely needs to be about grain marketing. And um, you've heard us when we give the market update, we always give a shout out to Cat's Grain in Washington, Iowa. They're a grain broker here in town, and they actually buy grain for several of the hog producers around here they actually buy the grain for their mills and so on any given day they've got umpteen bids in there and we're very lucky where we where we are that we have such a strong basis and so there are opportunities all the time where when you get when you get close to fall you can see one hog producer versus another they're looking at they're out measuring their bins and they they know what what they need and what they need to get as soon as those combines roll so bids fluctuate a lot the closer you get to fall and then once we get into fall um they they can fluctuate a lot the same way really the year round but i'll just say this so today um all my beans are sold uh this is one of those years where the the basis has been strong uh, even at the river, and I felt like I had as good a price as I was probably going to get, and so I didn't, I didn't, I can store pretty much all my crop within within about fifteen thousand bushel. We can store all our crop on site, which that's something else that makes a difference. Obviously, if you don't have the storage to store your crop, you're probably not going to you're going to sell it all out of the field, or you're going to pay somebody to store it. And if you're doing that, that all plays into how it's, long you're going to hold it and all that. It's all different. Everybody's yeah. situation is different. But, um, you know, obviously we sell enough crop to pay the bills and... Ahead. Yep. Well, to pay the bills. And then when we get into fall, obviously before the end of the year, we got stuff we got to pay for. And then if you're lucky enough that you have income and you think, like any good farmer, everybody beats up on Donald Trump because he didn't want to pay taxes. Well, if you're a farmer... And you're paying taxes. I grew up on the notion that if you pay taxes, you're doing it wrong. Now, I've had a few CPAs tell me that that's probably not the right way to look at it. But obviously, if you if you have if you have any money left before the end of the year, there's always tons of expenses that you can prepay or pay for the, uh, stuff that needs done. That pretty much you're going to get rid of it. But all I'll say about the CPA thing is, if your CPA is telling you not to play the tax code. Like that's what the tax code's for to play, yeah. so you don't pay tax. Yeah. So you need to find a new CPA. Just saying, if you have somebody like that, we can jump off on that sometime. Um, yeah. I'll finish this thought and just say that um, I don't do a lot of. I don't play the board of trade. Um, I don't. I don't hedge. Um, that's something that you and I. You and I have had this conversation a lot. I am. I kind of go back and forth. I'd say I'm probably fairly close to getting to the point that I very well may have somebody market my grain for me just because I have too many times overstayed the market. Um, I did a really good job this year marketing 
up through harvest. And then the corn that I have left in the bin, I'd say, honestly, I should have sold it. And I didn't because I felt like, okay, well, this thing with the war in Ukraine and, and everything, I thought that um, there was more upside. And there still could be, but I feel like right now they're getting rain in South America. And I feel like the war is all priced in and this thing's just kind of dragging sideways. And if I had to go back, I would have just sold it all. So it's really hard to know what's right and what's wrong. And that's where maybe having somebody that you set some minimums with and you pay them uh, their bit to market your grain for you. I don't know. There's pros and cons of both. And I haven't done that yet, but that's something that we may look at in the future. Um, and at the end of the day, I'll just say that we're very lucky to be where we are because we have a very strong basis because of the the production agriculture, the the hog business, the cattle feeders. Um, we go through just a hell of a lot of grain in southeast Iowa, and as a result, we have really good basis levels, and there's, there's always opportunities. Um, and so... There really isn't a right or wrong answer for that. You just got to kind of figure out what works for you and where you're at, where you're, if you got storage, where you're, ba- where you are at, what your base is going to, what's it look like? Uh, I was going to ask you, and this is kind of a tough question because it's hard for us to give people advice on marketing their grain if they're in a different area because we've grown up here, you've grown up here your whole life with the basis being pretty damn good most of the times i know not all these hog producers were here 25 30 years ago but um do you have any advice for somebody that can't get insurance crop insurance because yeah you know because there's there's young guys out there starting out that you know they don't have the years of well and built up and um if you farm somewhere uh, if you're farming dry land corn, say you're farming dry land corn someplace where a lot of people are irrigating, or you're farming um, somewhere where you get the soil is light, and if you don't get consistent rain, I mean, it's it's a difference between having a crop or having no crop. Those guys have a real hard time using crop insurance because they can't get five years in a row of good Yield. yields to where it pays worth a crap. And if you're doing that, your best, I feel like your best investment is probably on farm grain storage in the fact that you kind of control your own destiny when you do that. Um, and you, you probably really need to work with somebody that is a grain broker that offers marketing because what you do have, you've got, in other words, whatever crop you end up with, you're probably not going to sell ahead because you're not sure if you're going to have a crop and you don't have crop insurance. So then you need to play the game where you may sell that crop, but then you may turn around and you may buy it back on the board at a price. If a price, you know, you may pay for the right to buy that crop back and then turn around and resell it. And that's where somebody that's a whole lot smarter than I am, that's a grain broker, can really help you out. And, you know, I feel like that that has kind of, there was a time that maybe that was kind of looked down upon because there were a lot of guys in the 70s and 80s that made a lot of money on the board of trade and then lost their ass. And I've heard older guys say that the worst thing that could happen to some people is, they make a bunch of money on the board of trade because it's kind of like a casino and then you lose your ass. Um, But you just have to be smart about it. And that's where today, it's just like when we talk about anything, there is so much knowledge out there that's free and there's so many people that are giving away um, really good information. And the competition between people that want to market your grain for you is probably stronger than it's ever been. So if I was in a situation where I couldn't, sell a head crop and I didn't have crop insurance, I would probably, I would probably market my grain in the fall after I harvest it and then pay for the opportunity to own that, re-own that crop at some point. And I would have to do it through a broker because I'm definitely not 
savvy enough to do it. You myself. could learn it probably though. I'm oh, no, sure I'm sure there's probably somewhere you can learn it. Internet guys, internet. Yeah. Uh, men- mentor, have somebody mentor you. I mean, I don't know. But yeah. and one last one last thing I'll say because I just heard a guy talking about this today is a lot of times we as farmers we get caught up on we get caught up on that bid, that really good bid that's here or there or wherever. And today a lot of us have semis that we haul our own grain and something that you really have to keep in mind is one even if you own your own semi and you're trucking your own grain which i do not my neighbor trucks my grain for me but even if you do that bid that looks like it's you know better than everybody else's your time to get it there your time sitting in line and that miles to go to get there, that all costs you something. And you have, I don't think, I don't think we do a good enough job as farmers of valuing our time. And that's one of the big advantages that we have here is literally, usually, not always, not 100%, but usually two of the strongest corn bids that I, that are around usually are within 10 miles of me. One's 10 miles south of me, and one's, well, not even 10 miles uh, northwest of me. And the trucking to get there is minimal, and they're both set up to where they got high-speed dumps. And so my neighbor that hauls my corn, he will happily go there. One of the Usually one of the strongest bids is in Cedar Rapids, but nobody wants to go there because they know when they go there, Waiting in line. You're going to be waiting in line. And so they charge accordingly. But if you're hauling your own, I know guys that haul their own, they'll go up there the night before and they'll sleep in the damn cab just to deliver a 1,000 bushels of corn. Well, what's that worth? At the end of the day, the time that farmers can say that your time's not worth anything, no, your time's worth a lot, and you got to figure that in. And, and so I think that's something that you need to consider when you're thinking about where you, not only what price you market it at, but where you market it at, mm-hmm. because um, that's valuable. And I just say every year is different. Oh, 100%. every year, what's happening on the world stage plays a huge factor, obviously, into the market. So just take every year a, differently, you know, because there, are, there, are, there's always shit going down sometimes. So yep. that's all I'd say. I don't know much about marketing. Dad does a lot. He does all the marketing for us. It's something that I want to get. I want to learn and get better at, but I don't have much knowledge in it. So you've kind of done that. You're supposed to ask me a question now. Oh, yeah. I was waiting for divine intervention. Okay, so uh, this question's from Phil, and he asks, how do you guys manage your time to do things effectively? And then with that, he also asked, how do you stay motivated and want to get out of bed every day? So I'll, I'll start with the first question. How do you guys manage your time to do things effectively? I think this is everybody that works for themselves. This is something that's super, super hard to nail down because especially when you're a farmer because fires or a business owner, fires come every day, shit knocks you off your schedule and you just kind of have to pivot and adjust. But I, I've, tr- I've tried to start becoming a list person. Um, I try to plan out my week. What are the tasks that I got to do this week? Who do I need to reply to for the the media side? Uh, what do we got to do get done for uh, the media side? Barn talk. If we need to make a podcast, do we need to do YouTube videos for TDF? Um, then all the farm work we got to do. Uh, you know, I do. You so you have your ba- like. I obviously know every day I got to get up and chore. So I'm not going to put that on my weekly tasks because that's not changing. I'm going to, the stuff that I do every day, that's a constant, I'm not going to put on my weekly tasks. I know I'm going to have to do them, but the shit that is interchangeable, I plan that stuff out. I just write down a list of all the shit I want to get done. And then every morning, you know, some, you know, I, sometimes I get off, but just about every morning I try to get up, look at my weekly tasks and then write down about three maybe five, three to five of those weekly tasks in my day. And if you don't get all five of them done, put the, the two or the one that you didn't get done that day into the next day. And you just, if you do that five days a week, six days a week, seven days a week, your weekly tasks will just 
go away. And so that's, that's something that has been really helpful for me. I'm not perfect because shit happens, shit comes up. But when I do do that, I feel like I get a lot of shit done. Um, and it also is nice because you kind of just see that list dwindle, especially when you start checking stuff up, stuff, stuff off. That's really, really nice. Um, and I use a platform called Notion. And Notion is a phenomenal platform for just about anything. Uh, if you want to communicate with your team, um, if you want to plan out your week, plan out your day, it's a really good platform to use. And so that's where I plan out my week. And then I just have a journal that I plan out my day in. And I kind of take, I think it's important to take your journal with you almost everywhere so that when you get done with a task, you can cross it off. Just keep crossing that stuff off every every task you get done. Um so that's, that's really what I've found to be effective for me, time management wise. Um, and obviously we work together. So sometimes our schedules don't always line up and one of us has to adjust. But I found that most of the time making lists, executing the list really, really helps most of the time. I have, I have the advantage in that I have two sons that are uh, very try to be very organized and I just kind of coattail off of them because if I can pawn all the things that I think need to get done off onto Sawyer and it makes it to his list, then he keeps me accountable and I don't need a list. But I have done, I have tried to do a lot better and I have gotten better over the years. Um, for me, it's a little different in that I feel like when I get up in the morning, one, get up early because you'll get nothing done if you can't get up early, I feel like. Um, and then I have to have, like, I want a chore first thing every day. And that's just a weird, it, it really makes no difference. It makes no difference when you do that task, really. But I get a sense of relief. Like, if I can get up and I chore whatever sites I'm choring, and I get that taken care of, then I like have a little sigh of relief because I know that no matter what else happens that day, at least I got done what had to be done. And that kind of helps me go. And something else that if you're making a list, not only your daily list, but you know, a weekly, a monthly, a yearly, a 10 year list. Um, a guy that I have a lot of respect for that I used to work for, um, he, he told me that write down what you, what the craziest goals you got, the stuff that you want to have happen. Say you got a 10 year, like in 10 years, I want to own this or 10 years, I want to build this. You write all that stuff down and a lot of, it's all going to seem like there's no way that's going to happen, but you do that and then you reflect upon that every month or every couple months. And he, he said, you'll be amazed in 10 years how many of those things will actually come true because subliminally your mind has got that floating around in the back all the time and people you end up talking to and things you end up doing will ultimately lead you to accomplish these things that aren't really apt they're kind of abstract on the front end, but you end up getting it. And so lists are important. And I'd say for us and our family, one of the things that is a real bonus, it can be a real detriment too, because you know we can all tell the stories about working with family, but we all keep each other accountable. Um, and that helps, uh, I'd say that helps us as much as anything in the fact that we're kind of together even though we're all doing different things at different times, we all talk about our wins and our, our failures and we keep each other accountable. And that, mm -hmm. that helps a lot. Yeah. And I just would say, um, when you look at those big goals and you get kind of overwhelmed or you feel like that can't happen for you, you just, when you figure out the power of taking it day by day, because that's all you can do is taking shit day by day. And if you just really try to focus on winning the day, every day, that shit compounds 
over time and you will accomplish your goals. Like, I just don't think people really realize how important it is to just focus on getting three to five tasks done that move you forward to your goals. It doesn't take, you don't have to do 20 fucking tasks in a day and be good. If you do three to five tasks every day to move you forward and towards your goals, there's, you're going to reach them. If there's so much power in compounding over time, a long enough time horizon that you'll get there. So just try to win the day. I, I try to do that best I can. And I think having a plan is important because if you're just wandering, you're never going to know where you're going and you never know what you're going to do that day. So have a plan, but don't, don't overdo it. Know yourself, know what you can do in a day. And if you do that long enough, you'll, you'll get where you want to go. Yeah. Um, as far as how to stay motivated, how to get out of bed. Um, I enjoy what we do. I enjoy building. Truthfully, that's, I'm doing what I love to do. I enjoy building shit. I love building a, a social media presence, a brand. I love building this farm. I love building businesses. I love doing all the stuff that I'm doing. And, you know, there's shit that comes with it that sucks, obviously, but I know you got to just keep your eye on, your mind on what it can look like if you continually do the work that needs to get done. Yeah. And what is the alternative? Like you got to think about, it's, it's, just, it's just back to what our, our kind of our Christmas special episode was about. You got to choose your heart. Are you going to choose the heart of staying in bed, watching Netflix, you know, spending all your time on your phone or... And then end up being depressed, lonely, unsatisfied, unfulfilled because you just do that for 10 years. You know, you don't strive for anything great versus the other hard, which is getting your ass up when you don't want to, completing your tasks, getting in good shape, getting smarter, whatever it is, whatever your goals are. And you do that and it sucks sometimes, but it's good other times. At least in 10 years, you're going to have a reward for doing that kind of hard versus the other hard, which is you're getting a kind of a shit sandwich and you're going to just continually keep eating shit sandwiches unless you pick the other hard. Yep. Uh, so that's my thing. I'm just like, what's the alternative? I, you know, I don't want the other hard. Yeah. On, on that, as far as staying motivated, what I think about is, and this goes with like staying organized maybe, but, I have said this many times, and I was just thinking about the examples. So life is about a lot of mundane days doing mundane stuff, working up towards a few big things that change the trajectory of what you're doing. And I'll give you an example. So I remember the day that we unloaded the first load of pigs into the first hog building that I built back in 2010. And I said to my wife, today is a day that changes the whole trajectory of this family. And I remember the day that you and your brother bought your first property and we went out for dinner because I told you guys, I said, this this changes your whole trajectory. And when Sawyer built his first hog building, I remember the day that we got that done. And I said the same thing. Today is the first day. Like everything you've been doing, you've been working towards this. And now you got it and it changes your trajectory. And that's that's why that list of stuff is so important because you do a whole lot of stuff that, seems like it you know it's not a big deal but if you have if you have something you're working towards you just chip away chip away chip away and then one day you accomplish one of those things on that list and then that just accelerates what you're doing or changes the direction of what you're doing and so my motivation is i think about those things that we're working towards and we can't get we can't change that trajectory unless we do all the little stuff to put us in the position that we can get that one 
that one win that's going to change. And so, yeah, that I would 100% agree with that. And I'd also say uh, so most days we're not motivated, guys. It's That's a sugar-coated word that people like to throw around, not digging or bagging on the person that asked this question, not digging on you, Phil. Uh, but motivation is a bunch of shit. You got to stay disciplined. Like, there's days where we don't want to go do load pigs at three in the morning, but we have to do it because it's that small task and it's going to get us forward. You know, there's days that you don't want to do shit, but you just have to do it because you, those are the days you got to think about what you're saying right there. You got to, you got to find it in yourself to go because you, you got to go or else yeah. you're going to have a hard life the other way. Um, there, I, I'd say that motivates me that right there. I think legacy motivates both of us. Obviously yeah. I feel like dad and I have been given an opportunity, um, that other generations before us didn't get as far as this social media, uh, the ability to learn whatever we need to learn to move us forward and get us smarter than, you know, previous generations. They didn't have this opportunity to learn as much information as we do. Uh, the ability to reach all you guys and reach people uh, by creating content, that would never existed. Uh, just the endless opportunities that we've been given, we feel that, you know, we can really leave our mark in a big way and we feel almost obligated to do so because four generations before us put their fucking blood, sweat, and tears into this thing and we feel like we have the most opportunity ever to take what they built and make it extremely better. And if, you know, that's, that's, that's something that really drives me. I feel obligated. Um, and then the last thing is, and this is kind of, this is kind of dark and deep, um, but I listened, I, I saw a video of, you know, Ed Milet, he's a really good uh, entrepreneur businessman that puts out content, but he talked about how you pretty much thinking about, uh, you know, your last time, like, I, I don't know, it was like your last time with a family relative and you were, maybe you were doing something that you didn't like doing with that person. But what if that was the last time? that you did something with that family relative. And I look at when we do shit together and like, sometimes I don't want to go and fix a cable curtain or a curtain cable. Sorry. Um, and you know, that's the last thing I want to do, but what if that was the last time that my dad and I worked together? You know, I know that's fucking sad, but you know, that might be the motivation you need to get up and go do that thing. You don't want to do because that could be the last time that you do something with that person. Um, we're lucky enough that we work together, but I'm just saying I use that a lot sometimes because that's just good advice for everybody that you that you deal with on yeah. a daily basis because we all deal with people that sometimes really piss us off. Yeah, and you know if you treated everybody that we won't go down that road, but I'll just say you know everybody deserves some grace because. Uh, Every day you run into people that you could be having the best day ever and you run into them when they're having the worst day they've ever had. So you just never know. So yeah. it's, it, you gotta, you gotta try, you gotta try to get out of your own, get out of your own yuck and be the best version of you every day. And that, boy, that sounds, that's like a, you know, whatever. And there's some days that let's face it, you're just going to suck, but. Um, it's getting back on the saddle. I, I'll say this, and then we'll move on. I almost feel like we have a little bit of an advantage or anybody that is in a situation where we are where we cannot kiss off chorn pigs. We, if you're raising any kind of livestock or a job where you have a responsibility, we chore our our hogs seven days a week, 365 days a year. And unless we're gone and we hire somebody to do it for us. And a lot of people would look at that as like, uh, like, a a hindrance. And yeah, sometimes you don't want to do it, but you know, really it's almost kind of like a blessing in the fact that that helps us be, that helps us be consistent. Because if nothing else gets done, and believe me, there are days that nothing else gets done except we get the pigs chored. But those pigs have to get chored every day. And 
I think if more people had one thing that they absolutely had to get done every day, we'd probably be we'd and all I, be better for it. And I think that when you do that one thing, you've given yourself some momentum. Right. 100%. Staying in bed, there's the ball's not rolling. You're right. not rolling. But when you get a task out of the way, especially the task that has to be done, that's probably the hardest thing that you'll do all day, yep. out of the way, now you're rolling a little bit. You know, you get you have a little bit more of like, okay, let's get some more shit done. Um, last last thing that I'll say, those are the three ways that I use to try to get motivated to get shit done. Thinking about if it was the last time that I could see my dad and work together. Um, legacy and you know, you got to just get the small shit done if you're going to make it long term. It's just the fucking reality and you got to be disciplined. Um, but last thing on uh, um, things, uh, how to use your time effectively. I think everybody, maybe not everybody, but my generation especially, young, young kids, 20s, teens, maybe, maybe early 30s, we all struggle with some screen time. And I do. I definitely struggle with screen time. I think it's, it's something that is low-key kind of a problem. It's becoming more of a problem uh, in, our, in society. I think it's a kind of a drug. The social media can kind of be a drug. Phone usage can be kind of a drug. And the dopamine is just constant. So I would strongly suggest limiting your screen time because I've seen my, in myself, I found an app that allows me to block my apps and I cannot get into them at all for a certain, a set period of time. And that's, that's what I needed because I don't have the willpower willpower to not click into that app. I want to click into that app, but when it's grayed out and then I click on the app and it tells me, no, 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 you got four more hours and then you can get into this app. That has helped me tremendously uh, to stay productive, stay focused on what I'm doing. Um, So I recommend the app Opal, O-P-A-L is what it's called. And it lets you know, it blocks the apps that you want it to block for a set period of time, and you can schedule it to do it every single day if you want. And so I block it pretty much all morning up until four o'clock, and then I have to post social media content, give myself an hour, and then I just block it again because there's no point in me getting on social media unless I'm using it for what we're doing. Uh, uh, And I'd rather stay productive. So, And I'm not saying you all got to go that extreme, but just... Really be mindful of that. If you're looking at your screen time on your phone and you're at f- six hours, okay, dude, you might you might have a little problem. You know, you might have something that you got to work on. And so I recommend that app because that's helped me out big time. So that's the last thing I'll say about being be effective with being effective with your time. So. I'm glad you didn't name people in their fifties. That must mean that I'm. <laughs> well, I know I I said younger people, but I know there's. It's it's across the board. It's yeah, becoming it's a problem across the board in society. And you know, I'm not saying never get on your phone, but it's you gotta you gotta be kind of mindful of it for sure. All right, I got one for you. Yep. Uh, Kyle asks if we have any suggestions for starting up a YouTube farm channel. Um, I would say that <sighs> there's so much you could say here, man. Uh, YouTube channel is. You just got to start. You, you just got to take the jump and start because you're never, you're going to talk yourself out of it a hundred times unless you just get in and start. And that will teach you a lot. Also, look at the other farm creators. Look at them. How are they pacing their videos? How many times do they change jobs? How many people are involved in the operation? What's what's the quality look like? What what shots are they using? What do people seem to like? Read the comments of these videos. What do people like in these videos? Just going and looking what other people are doing and seeing how they're pacing their videos, all that stuff, seeing what the comments look like. You'll learn so much just watching other people do things and obviously being mindful of how they're creating the content, not just consuming the content of, you know, them around the farm. Really be mindful of, okay, he switches the shot here. He switches persons people here uh you know this and that and that um that's what i did i really studied how that was happening but you also want to be original so you need to put your own spin on things just because one person does you got to find that balance of taking what's working but also putting your own spin on it so be mindful of that but really study that because 
right now in content, it's, 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 you're not too late. You got to start, but you got to be good. You can't just be shitty. You want to strive to be good because there's a lot of content creators out there that start, and this is just the reality, and they never, they never really get better because they don't do the due diligence of really understanding how to make their videos better. They just start posting. And those people just stay small and they never grow. If you want to grow a successful YouTube channel or successful any platform you're on, you have got to do your due diligence of researching what works and adding your own spin on it and just getting better every single video or else you're going to stay small and it's not going to work. That's, yeah. that's, that's, the, that's the reality of it. Um, and the other thing that you have to understand is that it is, it is like everything, and we just talked about how you just do stuff every day and then eventually something happens that changes. Okay, well, YouTube is the same way in the fact that when you put out a video, it's not going to go viral. I shouldn't say that because you could something could happen in that video that everybody just is like, holy cow, you got to see this video, and it goes viral, and you're off to the races. That probably isn't going to happen. Hasn't happened for us. It hasn't happened for us. Uh, we've been doing this shit for three years. Putting but, the videos out every every week. And that's the thing. Consistency matters and getting better matters. And the only way you get better is to do it, but then look at what you've done and say, what can I do better? But And look at other people and see just, what they're doing. You have to have... This is not investment advice, but you are making an investment that is going to pay dividends down the road. So in other words, the one thing that I always think is wonderful about YouTube is when we get somebody that is a first-time viewer of what we do, how many times we've gotten somebody that watched one video and then they send us a message and they say, I found your channel, I love it. I'm going back and watching all I'm, I'm watching all the ones that came before it. I'm binging. That's the beauty of what it is is as you grow and as you get people, every video that you have put out it it's there. It's there forever to where that is going to pay you dividends down the road because you have this catalog of content. It doesn't die on YouTube. Right. YouTube videos really don't die. Um and that's worth something, but you've got to put in the time. And it's it's not going to happen overnight. And understand it's it's work. It's not it's not it, people want to uh, glamorize being a creator. It is a fu- it's well, it's work, boys and girls. It's and, work. And people that don't people that have no idea and those people that are not supportive of you, they will be dim- dismissive of you and if I, I don't know how many people have said this to me, but a few that have seen a video or heard from somebody that has watched our stuff that does, doesn't even watch it, and they say, oh, well, I should pick up a camera and do that. And when they do that, I say, yeah, you should. It's e- it, God, it's the easiest thing we've ever done because it's not. It's one of the hardest things that mm-hmm. we have to do. As far, It's not physically hard. Sometimes it's physically hard. But mentally, it's one of the hardest things that we do. And when people are dismissive and say like, oh, yeah, I wish I could just shoot, you know, I could just shoot videos and, you know, whatever. You're like, yep, it's that easy. Just do it because it's yeah. not. Yeah, you got to you gotta put in the work. You got to be consistent or else you're never going to grow. That's the other thing. You got to just post every week. You got to set what you're going to do. If it's one video a week for ever that's what you're doing do it and then if you can ramp it up ramp it up uh but the more videos you put out the better you're going to get the better traction you're going to get the more the platforms are going to reward you last thing that i'll say is youtube's a good starting platform but if you want to build a, a really s- good brand you need to be on all platforms you need to be on facebook you need to be on instagram you need to be on tiktok and you need to try to promote your youtube channel because ultimately, YouTube and I'd say also podcasts is where your most loyal fan base is, your most loyal audience is, but you also got to get people to your YouTube channel. The organic reach on YouTube is not as great as it once was. So TikTok organic reach is great. Facebook organic reach is great. Organic reach is great right now. Um, so 
trying to promote your YouTube channel through other platforms is also a really good way. But you got to start somewhere and that could get overwhelming. So just start out small, but just realize if you're not getting the traction you want and you know that your videos are good, you got to get on these other platforms. And the last thing I'll say about that, why it's important is if YouTube ever gone went away and that was the only place that your brand lived on, you're fucked because now if that goes away, you're screwed and you lost your whole brand. So being on all platforms is important for that reason as well. But that's all I'll say. Um, okay. We will say rave. I think rave. Is it rave? Rave, rave asks, I was wondering what you think works better. Why dropping anhydrous or fertilizer on the planter for a smaller farm? Yep. So there again, this is one of those questions that, I could, I could like instantly piss off <laughs> almost everybody. So it really depends on your situation and, and how your operation runs. I will just tell you from our, for our operation here, we do not use anhydrous and we never have. And mostly because we have hog manure. So we, we are only using um a little bit of nitrogen either with a we put it on with the planter and we're using that with single disc openers so two by two we don't use y drops although i will say this um when i first started no telling i was putting on um i was putting on uh 30 pounds of nitrogen with uh sulfur and I was doing that with single disc openers. And then I was putting pop-up in furrow with Keaton seed firmers that had the tube in them. Uh, I was not using Y drops. But we, I don't know, about three or four years ago, we went away from that. Um, and the only extra fertilizer that I put on is if we decide to side dress. That said, if I was in a situation that I didn't have hog manure... I definitely would be putting on uh, fertilizer with a planter, either either doing single disc openers or probably doing Y drops and possibly doing in furrow pop up. I guess I'm not 100% sure on whether I would do that or not, but one way or another, I would be putting on fertilizer with that planter um, just to get it out there uh, for when that for when that plant first takes off. Our fertility has changed we've talked about this before but from the time that i really started making the decisions as to what we were going to do till today we have changed so much in our operation you know i grew up in a time where we broadcast all of the manure from our hog buildings and we didn't have enough manure to cover all the corn ground um, we were planting corn in 36 inch rows and we were planting probably populations of 24,000, 26,000, something like that. And we were doing no, we were doing no fertilizer with the planter. Um, and we were moldboard plowing. Uh, we tilled the shit out of everything. And today we basically no till, um, you know, we inject our manure. So you can, you can argue whether or not we're tilling some, um, doing that drag line. Um, our fertility is a lot higher. Our organic matter is grown. Um, we're using some biologics. So we've just changed an awful lot of things. But to your question, um, I don't really know. I don't really know much about anhydrous in the fact that we've never used it. Um, but um, I think that there's definitely value there if you're using the right. If you're using the right. Um, mix of fertilizer with a planter. And there's so much to learn when it comes to soil fertility. Um, and I definitely don't know squat. I feel like I get kind of godsmacked every time that I go to a meeting and listen to somebody. Um, I was listening to a guy the other day and he was talking about, he was talking about um, uh, phosphorus and he made the comment that Phosphorus can only move in the soil like maybe a quarter of an inch a year. So basically what he was saying is if you're broadcasting dry fertilizer, 
your phosphorus level at six inches may not be it may be way higher than that in the top inch of your ground if you're especially if you're no tilling because it only moves a quarter of an inch a year and that really got me like bamboozled because i'm thinking of going to corn on corn on everything because we have this we have this supply of manure that we've been giving away for part of our acres and to me in my farm it just makes sense to utilize that so i'm thinking about going corn on corn but we're no tilling and i'm like well how much of the nutrients from that manure are trapped like how do i get that fertility to go down i should get i should get uh Mitchell Hora back on here. He just, can yeah, we me should also say we should try doing some cover crops too. I mean yeah. we're we've been thinking about doing if we go the route of corn on corn, yep. you know, I think it'd be good to have cover crops too with the manure. Uh, and I think that's where we're headed because we got it we're looking at ways to try to get that soil opened up that that fertility can go down. And, so anyway. And we're a smaller farm too. So we're trying to maximize every acre we can and make every dollar we can with what we got so obviously corn would probably you know it's going to make you more money because there's more of it yeah. uh but you got to also do what's best for the land so um you know you have to find that balance but yeah cover crops corn on corn manure we think that could be a good combination yeah so. we do uh anyway that's the best answer i can give you on on your question so thanks for sending that in uh for you I have, and this this is a good one. Um, Alex asks, I am a maturing, oh, as I am maturing, I'm right with you. I'm I'm trying to mature. I'm trying to mature some too. <laughs> one of these days I will. Mature, I will you say mature. Yeah. He, you say mature or mature? Well, I think if you're mature, but if you're getting there, you're maturing. 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 I don't know. I don't we know. Both, Sometimes my tongue is a little too big for my mouth. I can't. Well, really I have that problem. So here, I'll give you guys a little bit of a funny, funny uh, comment that oh, I got. Yeah. This is when you when you start putting yourself out there. This is the kind of comments that you can get. I could, you know, this was this this was a deep this was a deep. Uh, you know, I've been have I usually get we get a shit bunch of shit comments, and when you see them, you just you kind of come numb to it. But sometimes there's one out there that hits you and you're like geez that person really must be that person must really be pissed off with how his life's going or her life's going right now and i'm not going to say who it is but this is what somebody said on our last podcast every episode i become more convinced sawyer has full-blown autism (laughs) i know guys that i i fuck up my words sometimes but gosh i i didn't think i'm i don't think i'm that bad uh but it's this is a lot easier to watch and think that you can do it, and then when you get in the chair and actually start speaking on the mic, good luck. Because you know it ain't it ain't the fucking easiest thing in the world. And I'm not a natural at this, guys. I'm I am trying my hardest to get better, and I think I have gotten better. But have some grace on me, and have some grace on Dad too, because we are just farmers that picked up the camera and started recording and got this barn cleaned out and started uh, talking into microphones. So. I'm not claiming I'm a good public speaker because I know I'm not, but I'm trying to get better. So uh, thanks for that, I guess. I'll just can put that on cards? my shoulder. huh? Can you count cards? I can. You like Rain Man? I we can, can a little bit. The, take you to the casino. I'm good at poker. Clean up. If I, if I, I guess if I had, I, you know, I'm, I don't know. I, I, I'll have to try that out. I, I would have thought maybe he would have said Tourette's because sometimes I stutter, well, stutter, I stutter. That. But like autism, huh? I feel like I'm kind of lucky in the fact that I'm I'm old enough that people kind of leave me alone. They just feel sorry for me. Yeah. One, they see me. If you watch the if you watch the video version and you see me, people are like, "Oh, I that, think you're just the favorite." That poor bastard. People just love you. Well, they you know they respect. And they their look elders. at me as a young kid and they go, "Fuck that kid." That fucking kid. Yeah. I don't know, but yeah, I just got to put that on the shoulder. Every shit comment you get, you got to use it as fire. So thanks for that. I appreciate it. Okay. I'll try my best to get better. I'll, I'll get back to this. So Alex says, I have noticed I do not handle stress well. Stress is associated with all farms and businesses, and uh, I understand that. I would like to hear your thoughts on this, as many young people have an incredible passion for farming, 
but the stress can tear them apart. I feel there are ways of handling stress and improving your own tolerance. Is it something that comes with time as your management skills progress? Where does a young person begin on the path to improving stress tolerance? Is this something you two have dealt with before and how do you handle it? And is this something a person has to come to terms with and just decide they're not going to have their own business? Wow. Yeah. This that's a good that's a really good question and I would say yes to it comes with time. You get your stress tolerance definitely gets better over time. Um I just saw a clip of I don't quote me on this. I think it's the the mayor of Miami. Um and he owns a billion dollar business and he's also the mayor of Miami. Could be wrong on the city, could be totally wrong, but I know he's the mayor or some some political official in the state of Florida, um, and somebody asked him, "What's more stressful, running, or what's what's harder, running a billion dollar business or running being the CEO of a uh, major city?" And he said, "Obviously, the major city." And uh, you know, he kind of asked him, "How do you handle the stress?" And he said he went to his doctor a few weeks back, and you know, they did blood test on him, and his cortisol levels were low as shit. And the doctor was just like, how the hell do you do all that you do and your your stress level is down here? Because cortisol is related to your stress, how much stress is on your body and in your mind. And he just said to the doctor, he said, "You, when you've been doing what I've been doing for so long and have gone through periods where you're stressed out of your mind, you start to get calloused. You know, your, your stress tolerance gets calloused uh, and you just don't get stressed out as much as you used to. Um, and I think that's that's a huge thing because, you know, I definitely was one of those people. I think it's just something that you go through when you're young. You stress about every little thing. You stress about dumb shit. You stress, you just overstress and overthink yourself out. Um, but there are ways I think that you can help with stress. I mean, obviously you really just got to try to I think confining in people and confining in people that make you feel better about the thing that you're stressing about is really helpful. I do that a lot with my therapist here, uh, Torque. When I'm stressing about stuff or I feel down about a business idea or the content's not working or, you know, you get on yourself and I confine in my dad and I'm lucky to have my dad in this, he always makes me feel better about it. He always makes me feel like you're just you're overthinking it. Look how far you've come. You're going to figure it out. And, and you you give me, you light my fire again. You make me feel good about my situation again. And finding somebody like that, I think is hum- is just huge. It's, it's awesome to have that. Um, and I'm very fortunate and lucky to have that. Unless um, I'm the one that's stressing you because I'm just chewing your yeah, ass. Yeah, that happens sometimes. <laughs> But so, usually I just throw it back at you if you're doing that to me. So. Yeah, and I think that's a that's a good trait that our our family has gotten rolled down from generation to generation. So uh, when I read this, so my first thought was I was a salesman for I worked for a company for a long time selling hog buildings. And that's a very stressful position. It's a very rewarding. Sales is great because you kind of build your own destiny. It's the closest thing, I think, to owning your own business without actually owning your own business because you're responsible at the end of the day. You build your own destiny. And, you know, every year you'd get to the end of the year and you'd feel really good about where you were. And then my boss would call me and say, you know, what, what do you got for prospects for the next year? And you'd be like, oh, fuck. Because everything you did, everything that you built, everything that you you did, that all is in the past. You got to start over every year. And that was stressful. But if I go back to when I was a child, <laughs> and, you know, you probably couldn't you probably couldn't do this today. Well, I don't know. It's it is what it is. My dad was a military guy and I'm sure that in his time he endured some ass chewings that were probably pretty unbelievable. And let's face it. Uh if you were sitting in the cockpit of a fighter plane somewhere over Germany and you had somebody 
trying to end your life shoot you down pretty stressful. And when you got out of that, nothing probably felt anywhere near as stressful as that. So perfect example of stress tolerance. Yeah. He went through some insanely stressful shit and continue. He probably so, got back and was like, nothing compares to this. Yeah, and nothing. So when I would get upset, he would say to me, well, what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? And usually as a kid, you know, somebody was picking on you or some girl wouldn't talk to you or whatever it was, you know, to you, it was a really big deal. And he would say, well, what are you going to do about it? And I would sniffle along and say, well, nothing. There's nothing you can do about it. And he'd say, well, quit fucking worrying about it then and let's get back to work. And then there were times, you know, that something went wrong and I maybe I didn't do something right and I got an ass chewing. And I just said this the other day. In my time as being a salesman, there was never a time that I had somebody, a customer or uh, somebody that worked on the crew or a dirt contractor or whatever that was pissed off that, you know, I was a salesman. So ultimately I was like the, I was the job site supervisor, even though we had had those people. But, you know, it, the buck kind of stopped with me. And I had my ass chewed many times, which for a lot of people would have been really stressful. But for me, I could honestly say that nobody probably ever chewed on me as hard as my dad did. And I was always like, not bad, not bad. And it didn't really affect it. I mean, it did, but it didn't. But the, the most stress that I got, I think, was over how am I going to, how am I going to do better than I did last year? How am I going to sell more than I did last year or do as good as I did last year? How am I going to provide for my family? You know, going through raising pigs in the 90s, all of those things today... I don't feel like I really get, I, I get a little stressed sometimes when stuff goes wrong, but it's the same thing. Yeah, it's very rare that dad is ever stressed. And my mom is a complete opposite. My mother stresses about a lot of shit. And she there's does. dad where he doesn't stress about much of anything. Um, and I le I'm leaning more toward, I'm more like you in that fact, I think, because there is shit that, uh, comes in your life and that comes in your business or comes in your farming operation that yes, that is stressful and that I don't think you're going to get away from that. Not, you know, that's going to be stressful no matter what, but then going and stressing about other shit, like the level of pe the level of stress that people I think have is they'll stress about everything personally, yep. business, farm, uh, relationships, some of that shit, so there's there's just so much little shit that people stress about, but you got to just, you got to really try to, I don't know. I just don't sweat the small shit, really. I really try not to sweat the small shit because if you are always constantly under stress, it's going to make those stressful situations inside your business and your farm even worse on you because you're already stressing about everything else on top of that, and it's just going to be harder to deal with it. But I would also say... Stress is an emotion, and stress is not necessarily a bad thing. No. Stress puts pressure on you, to but pressure is almost, it can be a good thing. It either makes or breaks you, and when you're going to be running a business, you got to perform. When you're fucking Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady, you don't think they're stressed out in a game? You don't think that they've they've been under pressure uh you know they do but they don't they don't dwindle at the idea of being under pressure and being stressed they perform because they have to perform and you just have to kind of change your relationship with stress it's going to come in your life no matter what there's always going to be shit that comes in your life and i think as you get older and the more you put yourself in stressful situations the less stressed you'll be, but you'll still be a little bit stressed. And don't always look at that as a negative. That's right. not always a negative. That might be the fire that you need to get the shit done that you got to get done. Uh, because 
I don't know. To me, there's not much else that motivates me more than stress and pressure. Right. I I mean, I don't know. I don't know what what else. What else? I don't know what else really gets me going besides pressure and stress. Um, happiness doesn't. You know, happiness is one of those emotions that's great, but does that push you to be? to be better and put you in stressful situations because ultimately I think the best comes out of yourself and out of your business when you're put under stress because you learn what you need to learn and you gain confidence and you realize that you can perform when shit's when your backs up against the wall so you know one of the this is kind of like I think I feel like a lot of people say this but I and I've said it I haven't learned a whole lot from everything in my life that went just off perfectly. Most everything that I've learned, important lessons I've learned is from all the stuff that went wrong. And that's direct, directly related to stress. I mean, when stuff goes wrong, it's stressful, but you learn a lot from it. Uh, one thing I will say that will help you and learn how to compartmentalize um, your your stress in other words if if you have a stressful day on the farm and there's something that's broke or there's something that's wrong and you know it's got to be fixed or whatever it is but you can only do so much in a day's time and when you walk in that door to go home it does not do anyone in your family any good to stress them out over what they obviously can't do anything about. So you need to learn how to check those emotions at the door. And, you know, I'm going to do what I can do today. And then I'm going to go home and I'm going to be as good a husband as I can be and as good as father as I can be. And then tomorrow when I get up, I may leave the house early and go take care, go work on whatever I got to work on. But while I'm not doing that, there's no use of being stressed about it. And yeah. that's not the easiest thing to do, but I've learned, gosh, I when I think back to all the stuff that I lost sleep about, that at the end of the day, you know, in the middle of the night, you wake up and you think about something that's such a big deal. People problems with customers that I had to deal with and I would angst about actually dealing with them and then I would go meet with them and it was like no big deal like it was a 20 minute conversation problem was resolved wasn't always resolved the way I wanted it to be but it got resolved and then I would leave and I would be or I you know would go about my dad I was like geez why did I get so stressed out about that Usually the reality is not nearly as bad as the you, as the, the the picture you paint the, in your head. Hundred percent. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Yeah, I don't know. I I hope this answers your question. We both have dealt with stress. Mm. I think that you have to. I think also, and I would relate to you. I mean, you you didn't probably ask you me as much as Grandpa asked you to you, but getting your ass chewed, getting being in stressful situations early in your life is it's foundational it it helps you with stress it calluses you the more you are under stress the more pressure and stress you go under you become less affected by it and you almost become more like i need to take action i need to i need to be driven by it i mean honestly i want to ask you what drives you forward more than you know, to get something done than stress. It's like, because I mean, fuck, I angst about all the stuff we got to do, like back to the list. I'm making that list because if I know I don't make that list and I don't know what I got to do, I'm going to get stressed and I'm either going to have to, I'm going to have to do that shit regardless, right? And even looking at that list, it can kind of stress me out and overwhelm me a little bit. But you can only do so much in a day. You can only chip away at it so much a day. Yeah. 
and that you almost have to come you have you almost have to come to terms with using stress to to help you perform but also realizing that you got to you got to leave you got to leave your emotions at the door like you you can't you can only control what you can control and you got to control the controllables and you can only do so much in a day yeah and there's a lot. I could do a whole episode about this. Yeah, because you could. You totally what could. we're talking about is what's wrong with youth sports in America? What's wrong with not letting kids fail in school? What's wrong with not putting kids in stressful situations? Yeah, it, I mean, jobs where nobody gets fired and, and nobody gets told that they fucked up. You, everything we do, and and I I am the product of this. I'm the youngest of three sons, and I was the most spoiled. I was the most spoiled of all of them, and I had to learn. The lessons that I had to learn on my own off this farm were lessons that I should have learned on it, but I was treated, I was treated more softly, as hard as that is to believe. I was treated more softly than my brothers were, and I had to learn those lessons on my on my own. And it is we are in times today where men and people that are maybe it's not the man, maybe you are a single mother. Your life is stressful because people are relying on you. It is it is a lot of what drives me is the wolves at the door. Like, nobody's coming. Give me, I'll give you the Mel Robsons. If you own your own business, or if you are the head of your family, and you have people that are relying on you, nobody's coming. It is on your shoulders to perform, to take care of that family, to provide for those people, and guess what? That is fucking stressful. But you perform because of it. Yeah, you had you. It's either you either fucking crumble or you perform. Right. And today we coddle people, and we we for some reason we want to tell everybody that you can crumble. It's fine, crumble. Well, no, it's not. I'm sorry, it's not. I mean, it sucks, but that's how you end up in situations where worlds fall apart. Is when you have a majority of people that cannot take responsibility for their actions, be willing to sacrifice for those that depend on them, and to go towards a hard situation instead of running away from a hard situation. All of that is stress. And you have, it's a muscle. It is. At the end of the day, it's a muscle. You got to exercise that muscle. And... It's harder for some people than others, but yeah, I think that was really it. good. I agree. I, I, I mean, you can't run away from it. It's it is part of life. It is it's an emotion. And you asked your last question was, is this something a person has to come to terms with and not have their own business? You could. I mean, you're going to have to come to terms come to terms with it. That if you're going to try to be a uh, own your own farming business or own your own business, you're going to be more stressed probably than the average individual but the return on choosing that life could be better than what most people get out of life that's what you also got to look at uh i would say that you can dude you can you can still start your business you can still be in farming you, this belief that oh i can't do this if, if i'm going to be constantly stressed out like there's I feel like every there's a lot of CEOs out there and a lot of successful people out there that are stressed. A lot of successful athletes, a lot of successful artists, a lot of successful farmers are stressed. But you just got to learn to use it. You got to manage it and you got to learn to use it to push you forward and to push performance out of yourself. Well, let me say one thing and then we can move on. So you also... Today, in this day and age, one of the great things is there are people that can help you because yeah. 
there's there's all kinds of stuff that stress me, but you want to know what stresses me more than anything else? Bookkeeping. I am a terrible, I, I am not that well organized. I'm probably the most well organized I am today that I've ever been, but that's still not very good. I have an accounting company that does my taxes. They get my bank statements. They balance, they balance my my books. And I just started doing that within the last two years. I have fought that my whole life. Pigs don't stress me. The weather doesn't stress me. Crops don't stress me. Sawyer doesn't stress me as much as bookkeeping. So I've offloaded it. And I I don't feel I don't feel weak. I don't feel inferior. I feel like I finally wised the hell up and said, okay, what is the most stressful thing that you have in your business that you're doing and you're doing a poor job at it? Bookkeeping. And there's a cost there. 100% there's a cost. But one, the quality of the records that I have is the best they've ever been. And I, I can do so many other things better not worrying about that aspect of our business. And it lets us plan and it lets us go faster on the other things we're trying to do. Now, that might not be your thing. It might be something else, but find in your business, in your life, find the one thing that is you are the worst at and stresses you the most and get help for that thing. That's a great point. 100% great point. You did. That was, that's a good point. I 100% agree with that. And when you're running a business too, yeah, get help. But guys, a business is you hire employees to do the shit that, Exactly what you said. The shit that stresses you out the most or the shit you're not the best at, you can you can hire employees. You can hire help. Like that's but that's, I didn't grow but that's up the that thing. Way. Here's the thing with that though. If you are not stressed in the first place, you will never so the result of that is your right. business will run better than it's ever run before because you hired something out that you weren't doing well that stressed stressed the shit out of you, right? And now your business is running better. If you were never stressing about that, right. you would have never done that, and our books are, would have never been as good as they are right now. Yes. Correct. So it, in a way, the stress helped you improve our farming business because you were stressed. Yes. There you go. It starts with stress. When, we were, when I was trying to create all the content, edit all the content, then edit all the short-form content to post on other platforms, I was fucking stressed. And I was letting myself down and I wasn't getting it all done and I got pissed off, pissed off about it and got I beat myself up. But then I wised up. We started making a little bit of money with, you know, monetization on YouTube. And I said, you know what? I'm going to hire some people to help me out with this. And I was able to hire some editors. Now, I don't have that stress anymore. And I feel like our media business is running better than it ever has before. And it started with stress. Yeah. You have to be willing to accept stress and use it, again, to perform. And it, the end result could ultimately help your business out in a huge way. Yeah. If you were never stressing about it, you would have never come up with the solution to solve the problem. Yep. So it's inevitable. But it's important. That stress part is important because... You, we did it. We did it ourselves. We learned how to do it ourselves, and we did it ourselves, and it was very stressful. And we made the decision that we needed to do what we were actually good at, which was create the content. And even if it meant that the little bit of money that we were making, that we didn't take that money for ourselves, we turned around and we invested it back in the company. And the example I'm giving you is you can apply that to anything. I think that you need to you need to embrace the suck and you need to learn how to do things in your business, things in your life that you aren't necessarily good at. And that stress you out. But, that stress you out, but you need to do it. 
then if you were able to offload that, offload it. But what's great about that is you know, at that point, you know what's involved and you know How to what get it, it takes done. to do it. And so you can weigh the value of what somebody is charging you to do it because you've done it yourself. If you just start out and say, oh, I don't want to do that, and you just pay them, somebody's going to take advantage of you, what, regardless of whatever it is. Because if you haven't put in the time and invested the stress of doing it and learning it yourself, then how are you going to know whether or not you're getting value for what you're paying somebody to do, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So that stress is important. But at the end of the day, everybody has something that they just, it, out of all the things that are stressful within their business, within their lives, there's that one thing that, man, that's what keeps you up at night. And if you can take that thing, and even if you don't offload all of it, if it's something that you get somebody to help you with that thing, that's worth it because that brings down the whole level throughout your whole life. Mm -hmm. So you can't be scared of it at the end of the day. You got to, you got to take it head on, man, and get help with, with, with what stresses you out. But you also just got to accept it's the reality of life and it's the reality of business. It, it truly is whatever, whatever business you're in. But last, last thing, and then we'll be done is find something that doesn't stress you out. Find something that helps relieve your stress. For me, that's the gym. I can go to the gym. I can put my headphones in. I can listen to some damn good music. I can take my pre-workout. And I can go pump some fucking iron and not have to think about shit besides focusing on what I'm doing. And that helps me out a lot. That that raises my endorphins. I feel better about myself. I feel better about my situation. I feel good after I'm done working out and I feel less stressed. Exercise is a great way to release, to let go of some stress, but that might be fishing for you. That might be hunting for you. That might be you going in your garage and start tinkering on something. I don't know what it is, putting a puzzle together, but there's got to be something that you do that you just tone everything out disconnect disconnect and you can just relax because you got to have something in your life everybody's got to have something because i'm not saying be stressed 24 7 and that's going to help you perform you don't want to do that you got to have some time that you you let off the gas pedal and you just you just be and then you can go back to stressing later but that's the last thing that i'll say is you know what we should do hmm we should get like $125 a piece. I, I'm game. And at the beginning of each episode, I give you $125. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, you give me $125. Because what we have here, this is like therapy for me. Talking because, it out. Yeah. I, as much as if you guys enjoy this podcast, I just want you to know, because I thought about this as I, I got up here and I was waiting for Sawyer, of all the things we do and the content that we create, the thing that I love the most is shooting this podcast. Because it, it is really just, I mean, dependent, you know, we have guests and we have subjects, but at the end of the day, the conversations that we have are basically just conversations that you and I have anyway. Like mm -hmm. all the stuff we've talked about today, you and I have had this conversation, mm -hmm. not all at once, but off and on. And this, this is good. Yeah. So it is. Uh, what? Well, and thank you, Doctor. Whistler. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor Whistler. All well, he should do that. We doctor, should get a jar, Doctor. Doctor, doctor. <laughs> should get a jar and just hand each other and at the end yeah i yeah. like that idea uh but yeah um i also just feel yeah i was i was stressed when i first started doing this yeah you i was obviously nervous when you interview you interview your first guest and i was stressed yeah but look now it's it's yeah it's a muscle you got to work the damn muscle and i'll just say this you know what get out of your comfort zone at the end of the day working for myself the worst day, I've said this, I think I've said this so many times, 
my worst day working for myself is better than just about any day working for somebody else because the it is stressful but building building your own life can't beat it can't beat can't it can't beat it yeah there's no cap so that's what i'm saying to you you can say i can't handle running a business cuz it's too stressful well but you don't realize the other side of if your business is successful, you set your life up the way you want it, you have no cap. You can go as far as you want to go with that business. Yep. And if you take on a little bit more stress, you could have the life that you ideally want if, if your business is successful or your farming business is, success, is successful. So I personally will take the stress for building my own life the way I want it and not being capped out by somebody on how much I make a year or how much, how much free time I get to spend. I get to decide. Yes, there's more stress, but the, the return of that stress is so much better than working for somebody else. Period. Period. If this mic wasn't shut the attached fucking to this off. Arm, shut this I'd thing off. It. Just shut this fucker off. <laughs> That, that'll conclude it. All yeah, right, we got guys. a hawk. We got a hawk T-shirts yet. <sighs> hawk T-shirts. Yeah, oh yeah. Buy some merch. Yeah, if you guys want to buy some merch, <laughs> if you guys want to buy some merch, we'll have it in the link in the description. If you're watching on YouTube or of the show notes, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, thank you so much for supporting and uh, pay the fee, guys. Share it with your friends, family, coworkers, whoever. Um, and uh, we'll submit your questions at barntalkshow at gmail for the next Q and A episode. Without further ado, we'll see you guys here back next week for another episode. <laughs>